Good morning and welcome to worship on this Lord's Day. It's Sunday, September the 20th, and I'm thankful to have the chance to worship with you again this morning. As we sit in our own homes this morning, I know you, like me, are, are worried and thinking about those people all across the panhandle who are trying to pick up and recover from Hurricane Sally. We are actively talking to people in our presbytery to try to find ways that we can help them, but if you want to help someone right now, you can go to your computer and go to that website that I told you about a few weeks ago, the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance website. That's pda.pcusa.org. You can give some money right now and it will go to help those people, not only here in the Panhandle, but out west with fires and, and all around the world, people who need help. So you can do that right now. And as soon as we have a clear picture of ways we can help our neighbors in need, we will definitely let you know. For these moments now, we always have reason to go to God with prayer, to go to God with hope, to go to God with gladness. And so, with our hearts joined across the miles, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Come to me, follow me, be my disciples. We worship at the invitation of Jesus Christ. Come, let us worship together and share our witness of God's living presence in the world. our lives, we are calling on God who promises not only to hear us, but to heal us with forgiveness and hope. Join me as we pray together, saying, God of light, we live in the darkness of despair, worried about our lives, concerned for our health, fearful that we are lost from you. The yoke of our burdens lies heavy upon us, our unwillingness to forgive, our fears of one another, our reluctance to share what we have, our divisions and quarrels. We long to turn from the dark and live in the light. We yearn to leave what is evil and follow the paths of righteousness. God of mercy, shine the light of your love upon us and transform us with your love that your promised realm may draw near. Amen. The light of God's love shines into the dark places of our world, healing its brokenness and bringing hope to places of despair. The light of God's love makes us a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. I pray you are having a really wonderful week and weekend. I'm going to tell you a story. When I was a kid in an elementary school, there were some kids in my classes and they always seemed to get in trouble with the teacher and always had to go to the timeout or to the principal's office. And I really didn't want to have anything to do with them. I didn't want to be their friend. I didn't want to hang out with them or play with them on the playground because I was afraid I was going to get in trouble too if I was seen with them. 
but my parents, they always told me that I needed to be kind and um, friends, be friends with everyone. And in our story, Bible story today, we have Jesus hanging out and eating dinner with some people that weren't always nice and not always making the best choices and sometimes weren't even honest. And Jesus's friends and the people around Jesus who were watching him and seeing what he was doing were wondering, why is Jesus hanging out with these people? That doesn't make any sense. But Jesus knew that God wanted him and wanted us to show love to everyone, even if they're not the best decision makers or um, and they make bad choices. God still wants all of us to share love with everyone and be kind to everyone. Please pray with me. Good morning, God. Thank you for today. Thank you for loving everyone. Help us to share kindness and love with all. Amen. Our scripture lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. We're continuing our sermon series on what it means to be called during a time such as this. But before I read that to you, I invite you to bow your heads and join me in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come to you now with open hearts, hopeful to hear your word. We pray by the grace of your Spirit that the words we hear and the thoughts of our hearts will lead us to your will for all of us as your church and for each of us as your children. Dear God, we love you. We thank you for your love. Amen. So again, Matthew chapter 9, beginning with verse 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but only those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinners." This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As many of you know, our preschool has been in session for a little over a month now. I want to take a moment and tell all of you how proud I am of our preschool and all of the people who have worked so hard to make that possible. Of course, there were many volunteers who worked to put a plan in place, but it was really our teachers and our staff who are the real heroes who work every single day to make sure our preschool is a safe and a happy place. Some of you know I have a really warm place in my heart for our preschool because my mother was a preschool director when I was growing up, and she had wonderful spiritual gifts for working with children just like our teachers do here. And many of the children in our hometown loved my mom just the way our children here at our preschool love our current director, Allison, and, and our previous director, Miss Beverly, and all of our teachers as well. But as the director, every now and then, my mom had to deal with behavior issues. When a child was misbehaving, she would come in sort of like the principal of the school and try to help out the teacher in need. One day she was walking down the hallway and she heard a, a, a young child in the five-year-old class, William, was having a bad day. And so she stepped inside the, the class to try to help the teacher who had her hands full. And she walked over to William and invited William to step out into the hallway with her and have a conversation. Now, William was a pretty smart child, and he knew this invitation was uh, uh, really meant that he was in trouble. And so he looked up at my mom and said, No, Mrs. Clayton, I don't want to go out into the hallway with you. But one of the other children who was standing by heard this exchange and saw it going on, and she thought of the invitation in a different way. She thought my mom was inviting William out into the hallway to play. And so when she heard William's answer, she walked over and grabbed my mother's hand and said, Mrs. Clayton, I'll go out into the hallway with you any time. It's funny how we hear invitations in different ways. Depending on what's going on around us or what's going on within us, we might hear an invitation and interpret it in many different ways. 
That happens in my own household. Julianne might get a, an invitation for us to come to dinner with some friends, and she hears it as a great opportunity to spend time with friends and reconnect, whereas I worry that it might mean I'm going to miss a football game or a baseball game on TV. Or we receive an invitation to a wedding in the mail, and she sees it as an opportunity to, to celebrate with friends and family. But I see it as a price tag, uh, counting all the costs for all the things that it will take for us to get to the wedding, whether it's a present or a new outfit or travel or all of those things. We can receive the same invitation, but respond to it in two different ways. That's what happens in our passage this morning for the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus Christ is calling the people around Him to discipleship. But the people respond in different ways. In fact, there are two kind of main characters in this passage. One is the Pharisees, and one is the tax collectors. And both the Pharisees and the tax collectors respond to the calling of Jesus Christ, this invitation to discipleship, in very different ways. I want to start this morning with the Pharisees because I have to be honest with you, a lot of times in my life I respond to the calling of Jesus Christ in a similar way to the Pharisees. As you know, the Pharisees were, were the people in the ancient Near East who really knew the law the best. They followed the law every single day. They, they tried their best to outdo each other in knowing the law, studying the law, and following the law. And so Following the law of God was really a matter of self-righteousness for them. Their following Jesus and their following the law was a matter of who is better and how can I be better than my neighbor. And so when someone asks them to do something, when someone asks them to do something on behalf of God, they looked at it as an opportunity to sacrifice to sacrifice to God, to give to God something that they had, and then maybe to look down their nose around the, at the people around them who couldn't sacrifice as they did. And so along comes Jesus, and he asks them to follow him, and they think of themselves as already doing what God wants them to do, already fulfilling the law, already doing everything that God might require. And so how could Jesus ask them to do anything more? Sometimes I feel that way when I feel like I've dedicated my whole life and given everything I had and along comes somebody in the church and, and asks me to do more. I think of that calling as not an opportunity, but as a sacrifice. Sometimes we all feel that way about our calling. It's our opportunity to fulfill an obligation, an opportunity to maybe pay God back for what God has already done, to us, done for us and, and maybe in some ways to earn a little bit of respect or earn a little bit of righteousness too. That's how the Pharisees saw this calling for God. And I dare say there are times when we see it that way as well. But then there's the tax collectors. In fact, there's one particular tax collector in this passage, a man named Matthew. And I dare say Matthew sees this calling in a little different way. Matthew interprets this calling as a gift. And I'm not the only one who sees it that way. In fact, you might remember several years ago there was a, a little mini-series on the History Channel called The Bible. And the directors, Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, chose to, to include the calling of Matthew in that mini-series. When they were showing the, the episodes about Jesus, they included this little episode of the call of Matthew. And within that, they wove together this call of Matthew with the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. So I want you to watch that clip now and see if you can see the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector in this episode. All taxes must be paid in full! We're all Jews. How can they live with themselves? Our own people working for Rome. These people make me sick. Collaborators, let's move on. A stinking vermin. You should keep your distance from. 
two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other one a tax collector. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. But the tax collector didn't even look up to heaven. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God bless the tax collector, not the Pharisee. Anyone who praises himself will be humbled and anyone who humbles himself will be praised Matthew come to follow him. One has to wonder of the sins committed by his other followers. Could you see the difference? Could you see the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector? Could you see what it meant to Matthew to be called? Matthew didn't see that calling from Jesus as a sacrifice. He didn't see it as an obligation. He saw it as an opportunity. He saw it as a gift. It was a gift of mercy from God. You see, I've always imagined Matthew as a fairly lonely person, a tax collector, a sinner who was despised and rejected by all those people around him. Someone who had all the money in the world that he could possibly imagine, but really didn't have any friends, any place that he belonged, a place to call home. And yet here, out of nowhere, Jesus Christ calls him by name and says, You are mine. Come and follow me. He calls him away from this life of self-service and calls him to a new life, a more fulfilling life, a deep and meaningful life of service to others. I wonder what, how our lives would be different if we saw our calling that way. Not like those Pharisees who see our calling as a, as a calling to sacrifice, an obligation, but as a gift a gift of mercy, a chance to live a different life, to be who God wants us to be instead of just serving ourselves. You might remember several years ago, I told you about a really special book, one of my favorite books called A Same Kind of Different as Me. It's a really great book. I hope you've had the chance to read it by now. It's about two men, Ron Hall and Denver Moore. Ron Hall and Denver Moore came from opposite ends of the world, really. They grew up in two different worlds, two different lifestyles, but their lives crashed together because of one incredible woman named Deborah. Ron was a very wealthy man. He was a, an art dealer who had millions of dollars and uh, lived on a 300-acre farm outside of Fort Worth, Texas. He was married to Debbie and seemed to have everything in the world that he could possibly imagine, but for some reason he was still empty inside, empty enough to go and, and cheat on his wife, commit adultery uh, against Deborah. At the same time, there was another man, a man named Denver Moore, who had grown up as a sharecropper, who had faced crime, faced time because of crimes he had committed. He had had a, a harsh life, a difficult life, and was now homeless on the streets of Fort Worth. He was a very hard man, a difficult man, and these two men seemed to have nothing in common. 
But Deborah came to that homeless shelter one day where Denver Moore was working and decided to dedicate her life to service to others. And one day she convinced her husband Ron to come with her. And through time she convinced Ron to try to build a relationship with Denver. Of course, at first, Ron was fearful. He didn't know who Denver was. Denver might try to hurt him. He thought all of this was just, you know, just playing at trying to, to make ourselves feel good about the problems of the world. But Deborah had something else in mind. These two men who came from opposite ends of the spectrum built this relationship together, built this life together where now they found themselves called called to share with others about Jesus Christ and called to help others in need. Others who didn't have what Ron had and didn't have the, the experience that Denver Moore had. So these two men began to work together and help each other and they both realized it was all because this one woman saw something in each of them that they couldn't see themselves. God calls us in the same way. God looks at us and wants to offer us this gift of mercy because God sees something within us that maybe we can't see on our own. But this calling is a gift. A chance to be something new. A chance to live a life that's more meaningful than we ever imagined it could be. That's what happened to Ron and to Denver Soon when, when Debbie got cancer and she passed away, these two men had each other and they decided that they couldn't let what Debbie started end with her death. And so they continued to carry on spreading the good news of the Gospel, writing books like these to share with others what it meant to be called together as partners and what it meant to be called as servants of those people in need. My question for you that I want to leave with you today is how would our lives be different? What would it take for us to see our calling from Jesus Christ just like that calling from Matthew? Not to see it as an obligation or see it as some way that we pay back God for what God has done, but to see it as a gift. To see it as a gift for each of us. A gift to change our lives, to make our lives deeper and more meaningful than we could ever make on our own. As Denver Moore said, God calls us to love others not just for the sake of others, but for the sake of ourselves. Because that's truly what God's calling is. It's an opportunity. An opportunity to change our lives so that we can in turn change the lives of others. I have a dear friend from Atlanta who explained it to me very simply. She was a, a chaplain at a hospice, uh, in, a hospice chaplain in Atlanta. And people ask her all the time, how in the world can you do what you do? How in the world can you sit by these people who are dying every day? How in the world can you work with these people in despair? Work with these people who will never be healed? And her answer, I serve other people because it heals me. That's what God does when God calls us. God's calling us to serve others because God knows that it will heal us. It'll make us better people. It will make our lives here on this earth more meaningful, more purposeful. And it will give us hope that we can go out into the world and help those people in need. Make no mistake, there are people around us that are in need and it takes sacrifices from us to help those who are in need. But every time we are called by God, it's a gift. God calls us by name and says, You are mine. You're the one that I love. And I want to call you home. That's a gift that we all need every single day. So let us give thanks to God for this gift that we truly need. Amen. As disciples of Jesus Christ, God calls us to give. And that 
call to give is not an obligation, it's a privilege, it's a gift, it's an opportunity to share our lives with other people. And so let's continue to give as we have been doing throughout this time, just as you have been doing, and I'm so grateful for those gifts. You can go to our website, faithpcusa.org slash give. You can go to that Give Plus app on your phone, or you can drop your gifts off here at the church, and we'll continue to use all of those gifts for the mission and ministry of Jesus Christ here in Tallahassee. So let's continue to worship now by bringing to God God's tithes and our offerings. give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. These offerings we present to you, O Lord, may they be used for ministries of love and reconciliation through this community of faith. Amen. Please join with me in prayer. Holy One, spark of life, creation was envisioned by you and is sustained by you. In thankfulness, we pray for the world, that its riches and resources be used responsibly and fairly, 
that its leaders govern with justice, compassion, and humility. That humankind may live with an understanding and respect, noticing what unites us. Holy One, prophet of love, you lived among us to teach us, to show us how to love. In humility, we pray for siblings around the globe, For those dehumanized by their struggle for existence, may we listen. For those overshadowed by the constancy of death, may we notice. For those besieged by fear, anger, and relentless peril, may we show up. For those ensnared by systems beyond their control, may we demand change. Holy One, breath of being, you are here in this very moment as constant presence and insistent voice. In gratitude we pray, with boldness we pray. Inundate the world with humanity, overwhelm the world with truth, flood the world with kindness. Upset our indifference, accelerate our action, fortify our resolve. Compel us to authentic discipleship that nurtures creation, embodies love, and breathes life. We offer this and all our prayers in the name of Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you live into God's calling this week, do five things. Live simply, love generously, serve faithfully, speak truthfully, pray daily, leave everything else to God. And may God's grace, mercy, and peace live within you, surround you, and make you whole, now and forever. Amen.